All right, welcome everyone. My name is Sally Thurston. I'm from the Maynard Library. And on behalf of Tina McAndrew at the Randall Library in Stowe, we are so glad to, to have you with us tonight. Um, we're uh, thrilled to have Jane O'Neill back with us. Um, she has, I believe, done nine talks for the Maynard Library. Is that, does, does that sound right? Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is the, the second with um, our friends in Stowe. Um, and just so everyone knows, we are, Jane will be back on July 13th um, to talk about earth art. Um, so maybe you can just say a sentence or two about that at the end, Jane. Um, I'll put the registration link in the chat. Um, it will also be in the email you receive um, with the recording link after the event. Um, so watch for that. Um, and we'd love to have you back on July 13th. Uh, so, uh, Tina couldn't be with us tonight, um, but I know she joins me in thanking both of our friends groups for support of, of these two talks. Um, it's the Friends of the Maynard Library and the Randall Library Friends Association, both excellent groups um, working hard to bring uh, the library, help bring the library to the communities. Um, and I would like to mention just one event that uh, the, the Maynard Friends are putting on. Our book sale is um, this weekend, Saturday the 18th from 10 to 4. So we hope you hope to see you there. Um, and I think we should get started with the talk. <laughs> um, it's our very, very great pleasure to welcome Jane O'Neill from Cultural, Culturally Curious tonight. Um, she will be talking about um, the life and work of Keith Haring um, in, in honor, in celebration of LGBTQ Pride Month. So thank you, Jane, for that. Um, Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Uh, she's worked at some of New Hampshire's most distinguished cultural institutions, including the Courier Museum of Art, um, where she held the role of senior educator. Um, she's taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire University. Um, so. I'm gonna turn over to Jane, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Sally, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day today to learn a little bit more about the life and work of the artist Keith Haring. The name might not sound familiar, but I think the second you see an image like the one on the screen, you think, oh, that guy, yes, I've seen his pictures of his all over the place for decades now. He has this very distinctive, very easily recognizable style that helped to kind of launch him um, in the 1980s as a pop culture icon and an art world celebrity. And this style that he developed really came to sort of signify the entire decade of the 1980s. Keith Haring once said, Art is for everyone. And I think just the fact that we can recognize this artwork today tells us that the mission that he was on um, was at least to a certain degree, pretty successful. So tonight we're going to um, get to know Keith Haring and how he really strove to make his artwork as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And of course, learn about the issues that he cared about and his advocacy work around the issue of AIDS. So, so much to cover. Let's dive right in. Um, here we go with our program overview, how we'll spend this next hour together. And of course, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll um, circle back to everything at the end. So here we have a photograph of young Keith Haring. He stayed young for uh, essentially all of his life because he, he passed away at a very young age. We'll start off with an introduction to the artist, a quick intro, and then we'll turn our attention to how his work intersected essentially with graffiti art in the early 1980s. Uh, we'll take a look at how he rose to fame and acclaim both in um, the art world, but sort of more for fun within the pop culture realm as well. We'll also turn our attention to 
how he was able to market his artwork very successfully outside of the world of fine art. He sort of bypassed uh, fine art galleries and he did so with a, a great deal of success. We'll turn our attention to uh, his, his work in murals and then wrap up with aids and advocacy as well as the artist's legacy. So, so much to cover. Let's get started with a quick introduction to the artist. Keith Herring was born in 1958 and he grew up in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, a pretty small town, very traditional upbringing. Look at these photos. This is like the all-American nuclear family, am I right? He was the oldest out of um, the four siblings and he had three younger sisters. He had a close connection to his father who was an amateur cartoonist himself. So from a young age, like from one year old on, he would oftentimes sit in his father's lap, watch him draw, and then eventually sort of build off of his father's cartoons, sort of working collaboratively. Now, growing up, Keith Haring sort of missed the cultural revolutions of the 1960s, the political, social kind of upheaval that was happening, but he was aware of it. He talked about, you know, watching these things on TV, but he was far too young to participate in it. Instead, he was isolated for a lot of his childhood because he was so interested in drawing. He spent a lot of hours up in his bedroom, uh, drawing away with the music on. And we can see here uh, just some, some wonderful uh, images of him as a young boy. I love this picture of him sitting cross-legged on his bed with the Snoopy image right behind him. That's a good indicator in terms of, of what some of his early influences were like Charles Schultz and then certainly Walt Disney and Dr. Seuss. So basically the sorts of things that almost any kid would see today were, um, were models that kind of made a, a deep impression in young Keith Haring's mind. Now, I wanted to share with you briefly too, how at a young age, he really had a firm idea of who he wanted to be and what he wanted to do. When I grow up, I would like to be an artist in France. And we'll see um, that, that he, he manifests this dream. Dream. He makes it come true. And I think it's pretty wonderful to see in his own little boy cursive handwriting here that he was dreaming of this at such a young age. Now here we see Keith Herring grown up a little bit more. He graduated from high school in 1976. And from there he left the small town to and went to the big city of Pittsburgh to study uh, commercial art, essentially like graphic design. And he grew pretty disenchanted with this field pretty quickly. It might come as a surprise to, to some of you, but a lot of the people who are studying uh, commercial art with him were talking about how that was the art that was going to pay their bills. They had their passion product pro projects on the side that really kind of fed their souls. And so after a short amount of time, Keith Herring thought, why am I doing this? Why aren't, why aren't I just focusing on, on the projects that feed my soul? So he wanted, he knew he wanted to leave commercial art pretty quickly, but he did have some um, impactful experiences while he was studying commercial art in Pittsburgh. He was, uh, well, he had his first one man exhibition while he was there. So pretty young to have secured something like that. He was also exposed to the work of a few other artists that had a tremendous impact on him. One of those artists was Jackson Paul who I think is pretty familiar to a lot of people, known for his famous splatter paintings. This is his 1952 painting called Convergence over here on the left. Now, you may or may not have seen a video of uh, Jackson Pollock putting paint on canvas. He's essentially got the canvas on the floor and he's splashing the paint down um, with these kind of rhythmic movements. And for Keith Haring, he was really taken by the quality and expressiveness of Jackson Pollock lines. You can sort of um, start peering through these different colors of, of lines in these paint schemes on the canvas over here and realize that he's being really intentional about, you know, the way he's making the yellow marks versus the orange. So that was impressive to a young Keith Haring, but also the all over abstract patterning, this dense patterning here. We'll see a lot of that in Keith Haring's work. And then a little bit of this idea of the unconscious kind of taking hold as the artist sort of gets into the 
flow or the, or, or the zone when he's creating a work like this. I think we'll see um, this tremendous work ethic and, um, and this kind of rapid fire inspiration once we see Keith Haring in his prime. Another artist who had a huge influence on him was the artist Christo, now known as Christo and Jean-Claude. This is a photograph of um, one of their works in project, uh, pro pro progress. Uh, this is the running fence from 1976. It's a 24 and a half mile long fence that ran along the California coastline through several different towns. It's 18 feet tall, and it was only there for 14 days. And so what really made an impact on young Keith Haring was this idea that you don't need a museum, you don't need a gallery, you can create art works of art that can't be contained. You can create works of art that are ephemeral, that, that only lasts for a short amount of time. And you can involve other people in the process because certainly Christo and Jean-Claude did not build that fence themselves. So uh, with, with armed with this kind of inspiration, young Keith Haring leaves uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and he heads to um, New York City. We see him here um, looking a little glassy eyed on the New York City subway. Now he gets to New York City uh, when he's just 20 years old and he begins begins to take classes at the School of Visual Arts. He's studying painting, sculpture, performance art, that will come into play, I think, as well as um, art history and semiotics. So he's studying um, uh, signs and signifiers and how to interpret them. And I think semiotics really comes into play when you're looking at Keith Haring's artwork. Now we'll wrap up on this brief intro to the artist just by noting that when he arrives in New York City, there is um, this whole new generation that's kind of taking over um, in the club scene, in this kind of underground scene in New York City. And there's a, a great deal of creativity. It was like this creative hive and he was a part of it too. So we'll see how that hive sort of helps to launch him along the way. But let's turn our attention now to street art and subway drawings, essentially graffiti art. And this is how Keith Haring gets his toehold in the art world. So these are two New York City subway cars that have been graffitied. Uh, this is late 1970s, early 1980s. And Keith Haring did not do either one of these works, but he did say that he thought that the graffiti in the subways of New York City was some of the most beautiful art he'd ever seen. And this was like, the heyday for graffiti. This was really before the anti-graffiti campaigns kind of took over. So you had graffiti artists that would spend like eight hours on some of these designs. And what they all, what, well, what most of them had in common was a very strong black outline, the integration of text and visual. And for Keith Haring, he just thought it was, um, absolutely gorgeous. It was a huge inspiration to him. So here he is studying fine art, but he's really taken with what's happening in the streets and underground, literally. So during this time, he befriends um, an up and coming graffiti artist or street artist named Jean-Michel Basquiat. Here they are standing next to each other. Basquiat had um, sort of carved out a niche for himself in the graffiti art world by, uh, by focusing primarily on text with his tags. And that's one of his tags just behind him. So they are, um, they are forming the, this sort of tight knit relationship early on and, and Basquiat's uh, uh, star was also on the rise. Now, this is uh, not to say that Keith Haring never did spray paint graffiti, but this was really not um, the vein that he was most interested in. He was actually very aware that this was um, an art form that was really, um, uh, it, it was an art form that was really being primarily practiced by young African American men and young uh, Latino men. And he didn't really, he didn't want to usurp them. And he didn't really see how he as a young white man could fit in with that. He wanted to do something informed by it, but not exactly the same thing. So he tried to do something for a little while uh, that involved text and, um, and collage and kind of reorganizing the headlines from the New York Post. He would cut them up and make and rearrange them and make these new headlines. It all kind of had to do with like power and violence 
violence and subjugation. Um, so something like Reagan slain by hero cop, he would uh, take it, photocopy it, make like a hundred copies and then put them on lampposts all over New York City. And he liked this idea that he was involving people with what he did, that he was kind of forcing them to confront what he was making. But in the end, this wasn't the art form, the art medium that really spoke to him. That inspiration came one day while he was riding the train underground. When he got off the train, he noticed on the subway platform that, um, that the transit authority was putting this matte black paper over expired advertisements within um, the New York City subway system. And that black paper just looked like a blank canvas to Keith Haring. So he immediately went up um, on the surface level, bought some chalk, and then came back down into the subway. And he just started drawing. So um, so here he is in a photograph, um, hard at work, and, you know, the rest of the world is just, you know, doing their thing. I just love that this lady's chatting on a payphone as he's making a work like this. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice in this image here is that he's not making quick sketchy marks. He's doing very confident, bold lines, and he would do all of this without preparatory sketches, without any plan. He just would find the paper and go to work. And, um, and he started doing, I think, anywhere between 30 and 40 of these a day all over the city. And he became a little cultural phenomenon. People started to look out for these images. But of course, even though this is graffiti, even, this is, even though this is on temporary paper that's just a placeholder, he was breaking the law by doing this. So I love these images where it looks like he's you know, kind of looking over his shoulder to make sure that he's not getting caught. Now you can see these familiar forms already developing, this, um, these, these, uh, essentially like chalk outline figures that that he becomes so well known for later on in the 80s. Uh, he essentially develops a system of signs very quickly with the subway graffiti drawings, and he just uses them in different ways. So it's essentially like creating um, an alphabet out of these visuals and, and creating a different message in terms of how he mixes them together. Now he studied performance art. He loved this idea of people watching him at work. So occasionally people would pass by, see him working and maybe just stick around and kind of watch him because he worked so fast and there was so much confidence in what he was doing. He just kind of knew how to create an image. Now he loved the idea that people who might not necessarily ever go to a museum, certainly not to a gallery opening, could uh, see him at work in, in the subway and still have this kind of art e experience with him, even though they might not think of themselves as art lovers per se. So here are a few more of these uh, subway drawings. Now, I mean, there's probably thousands of them out there because he was really executing so many of them for so long. So here we see these simple um, archetypal forms here. It's like the everyman. There's no clothing, there's no hair, there's no face. We just read these as, as a typical human. Um, and we see that they're oftentimes in motion. He gives us these little squiggle lines uh, beyond that. So we can sort of understand these as like dancers or runners. And in this case, they're both touching a heart. So there's, um, there's a, a, an easily understood message when you see this. There's two people that have a love connection here. Over on the right, we see another figure. This time there's a heart for a head with a radiating baby inside. That radiating, radiating baby comes to be Keith Haring's logo. We're gonna see it again and again. He kind of uses it as a signature oftentimes. You'll notice with both of these two, he creates just um, a simple frame a, a drawn frame for these. And so some art historians have compared this black paper that he starts with as almost like the, a blank screen from a TV or from a computer. It's a different form certainly than, um, than a, a blank canvas, a white canvas or a white sheet of paper. So it does seem to have some sort of reflection of this modern era. But as I mentioned before, he, um, he can use kind of the same signs and symbols symbols throughout his, um, his entire body of work. And just by the different um, combination of forms, they might be read differently. There's a lot of references to um, 
Keith Haring's nuclear anxiety, for lack of a better term, in his artwork. So here we have a spaceship um, with a cooling tower over here. Everything's kind of uh, radiating in this in this case. But here, the spaceship seems to be interacting with these figures and um, and this rod. And there's a, a person on the back of a dog here. So they're fairly easy to um, to understand. The meaning might be different for everybody, but Keith Haring wasn't really concerned with the specific meaning of these of these uh, cartoons that he was creating. So you can think of these drawings that he was making in the subway as a synthesis of performance art, kind of automatic writing, because this was all coming to him so quickly and he was working so rapidly, and the democratic process, because he wanted as many people as possible to see these works. Now, occasionally he would get busted. This is actually a screen grab from um, a short piece about him that was on uh, CBS back in the 1980s. They were following him around the subway and then uh, they filmed him getting arrested. So he got arrested many times for things like criminal mischief and defacing public property, but it was usually just a, a, a small fine and then he was back at it again. Notice the t-shirt and the radiating baby. I particularly love this photograph here. It's a great photo. It's by a, a photographer named Seng Kwong Chi, who was a good friend of Keith Haring. He, Keith Haring would oftentimes call him after a day of tagging these um, uh, subway stations all around the city, and he would give his friend the location so that his friend could go out and document them. But in this particular case, you get the feeling that Keith Haring just finished this drawing out here where we see this kind of centipede type character with a uh, with a sort of a dancing human form riding it. And the centipede has a computer for a head and there's even more detailed cartoon within it. So Keith Haring has finished it. He's evaded the law. He slipped into the subway train the door is closing and at this moment that drawing is kind of perfectly framed and then it's going to be gone and you can see how distinctive it is from like the other kinds of graffiti that you see in the subway now Keith Haring's artwork became very popular people like I said people looked forward to kind of discovering new ones it brought them out of the drudgery of everyday existence just commuting on the trains in New York City people started to um, started to take them people started to sell them these days you can see them in museum settings you know these little rapidly executed drawings um, things that he might have done in just um, maybe five minutes now of course uh, are worth big bucks. So let's turn our attention to what happens after you become a famous celebrity subway graffiti artist. Um, how do you go from underground drawings to high art? For Keith Haring, that was fairly easy. So let's talk about his fame and his meteoric rise. Um, so in the midst of the subway drawings, the art establishment begins to notice Keith Haring. And early in the 1980s, he starts getting gallery shows. He starts getting invitations to um, create murals at, at different museums around the world, sometimes right inside a museum. As you can see over here, he's up on the scaff scaffolding. Over here, this is a jam-packed gallery opening um, with his with all, uh, different examples of his artwork, chock a block all around. Here is um, another image of a similar gallery set up this incidentally this mural right behind him with um i shouldn't call it a mural but it's a large-scale painting it's similar to the subway drawing that we saw before it's something that only took him two hours to do because he worked so quickly throughout his entire life and he was able to sell it for fifteen thousand dollars so he was incredibly successful at at a very early age now even though he had sort of penetrated this elitist and skeptical world of fine art, he remained passionate and very true to this underground subculture that he was a part of, um, even before he came, became famous and successful. So he could move from the world of high art <laughs> to underground clubs, and he could sort of do this seamlessly. And yes, this is Keith Haring right at the center of this picture, looking like he's having 
a quasi religious, uh, like cathartic experience on the dance floor here. Here he's at his favorite club called the Paradise Garage. You might even notice that the um, painting on the walls up above him are his very own. Now the Paradise Garage was a very open and welcoming kind of place. It was gay, it was straight, it was multicultural. And for Keith Haring as a young gay man in the early 1980s, this was like his utopia. I mean, he wrote extensively about it in, in, um, in his journals, but really it was this experience of going and dancing that was so um, just so thrilling for him. And it's probably no surprise that some of his most recognizable images are depictions of people moving, people dancing. And when you see him in, in a shot like this, you sort of get the sense that he might've had sort of similar jerky motions when he himself danced. So we see all of these figures that, you know, look joyful are in, are in motion. And I think it is, um, it's important to note too, that they have different skin tones that don't necessarily refer to actual skin colors, but it's a multicultural uh, dance party that he's showing us here. And that was important to him in his life. And it's a subtle thing that he's integrated into his artwork. Now, when he first moved to New York City, he really liked going to this one club called Club 57. This is him performing at an open mic poetry night where he's holding a TV screen around his head. It looks a lot like uh, some of the drawings that he does throughout his career. Uh, this, this notion of, of seeing a talking head on a screen is one that it clearly resonates with him. But later on in his career, he's doing these big, you know, highly polished murals for, for clubs like the Palladium in New York City. So um, throughout, it's, it's really about an expression of joy. But going back to Club 57, just for a moment, in these early days, he's spending time at this specific uh, place that was just a hub for young creatives. So here we see him, um, with Basquiat, and this is Madonna right at the center of the picture. She's really interested in something that he's holding up for her to look at. This was a place that Cindy Lauper went to, um, the B-52s, RuPaul, Fab Five Freddy. So there's all these like future celebrities, these really creative people that were gathering here. And it was really Madonna and Keith Haring's careers that kind of took off simultaneously. Madonna has written extensively about her connection to Keith Haring. She referred to them as different sides of the same coin. And I think they both had um, probably a little bit of a struggle with this meteoric rise that they both had, um, you know, leaving friends behind, um, having this sort of skepticism from the people that they've kind of left behind as they reach this new level of fame. Here is Madonna wearing a leather jacket that Keith Haring has painted. Over on the right, these are two tabloids that um, Keith Haring uh, sort of uh, designed on top of as a wedding present for Madonna when she married Sean Penn back in 1985. I just love these, these tabloids, Madonna on new pi nude pics. So what? That's a great wedding present. So at the same time um, that he's befriending Madonna, Keith Haring is also um, entering into the circle of, of Andy Warhol because in, in particular, because Andy Warhol is really taken with his friend Jean-Michel Basquiat. So he becomes very friendly with Andy Warhol. This is the two of them with those same tabloids getting ready to go to um, Madonna's wedding. Now, Keith Haring had a great appreciation for the trailblazing that Andy Warhol had done going back to the early 1960s. This, uh, this uh, introduction of the commercial world into the world of fine art. So to honor that, Keith Haring made up this character of Andy Warhol as Mickey Mouse that he called Andy Mouse. And it was essentially just drawing Andy as a cartoon and adding some ears here. It was a way to say, you are an American icon. And he did a number of renditions of Andy Mouse, oftentimes adding um, a dollar bill or a dollar sign to, to these works. And of course, that part of that is like Andy Warhol knew how to make money as an artist. But for Keith Haring, um, the fact that he was a rich artist was another signifier that he's like this icon of the American dream. Andy Warhol returned the favor, made this really beautiful portrait, silkscreen portrait of, of Keith Haring. Um, this is actually on a t-shirt, if you can see the outline of it um, at all. But 
Uh, Keith Haring added his own little Andy Mouse signature at the bottom. You can imagine this is a huge collector's item today. So Warhol helps to make a lot of introductions in his circle, um, including Grace Jones, the uh, musician and model. Keith Haring is shown here painting her body for, um, for a spread in Interview Magazine owned by Andy Warhol. The two of them became very good friends. They'd go out clubbing together for years. Keith Haring also uh, became very friendly with the most influential hip hop group at, of the 1980s, and that's Run DMC. He's pictured here with them. They are standing in front of one of his uh, designs in the background. He also designed um, an album cover for them as well as many other artists. Keith Haring also became uh, another icon, uh, became friends with Yoko Ono of all people. Here he is with Yoko Ono and one of her sons. Here, she, here he is again with Yoko Ono and his parents. You can only imagine what they thought going to visit their son with Yoko Ono. The two of them collaborated as well. This is like the marketing material for a week long uh, dance event that they collaborated on. Yoko Ono did the music and Keith Haring did the sets. So in addition to this kind of collaboration, I mean, the two of them actually just hung out. So this is Keith Haring um, hanging out at the Dakota at, in Yoko Ono's apartment on the occasion of uh, her son, Sean Lennon's ninth birthday. So for his ninth birthday, this is Sean Lennon right here. You can see him in a number of the images. Sean Lennon has just gotten a Macintosh computer and who else but Steve Jobs is there to tell him about his new Macintosh. And of course, that's Andy Warhol sitting in the background to be a fly on the wall for something like this. Now, here's one last mind blowing detail. On the screen of the computer is one of Keith Haring's little recognizable figures. So it's this incredible brain trust that's coming together in um, the first half of the 1980s. So we'll end this section on kind of fame and acclaim and where it's taking Keith Haring with this peek into his own apartment. It's a far cry from the Dakota, isn't it? It's covered with the graffiti from the graffiti artist that he knew and loved. And you'll notice here on his refrigerator door, he kind of used it as like a guest register. So um, over the years that he spent in this particular apartment, he'd have people sign it. Madonna actually wrote on it, Madonna loves Keith, Andy Warhol sign it. We, we're pretty sure Jean-Michel Basquiat signed it too. I think there's something like, 90 different signatures on it. And when he left this apartment, he left the refrigerator. The landlord ended up painting over all of the graffiti, but the, um, but the next tenant recognized that this, this refrigerator was really something valuable. And one hot day, it, it, um, it died. The landlord put the refrigerator out on the curb and the next tenant took that door off and, and stored it in her parents' attic for about the next 30 years. And just last year, it was auctioned off. Keith Haring's refrigerator door brought in $25,000 at auction. And you thought your appliances were worth a lot of money. <laughs> Just have a celebrity sign your next one. So all of this shows us that Keith Haring knew the right people in the right places. And he was sort of primed to become a commercial success, particularly because he was friends with somebody like Andy Warhol, who had already kind of mastered um, marrying the commercial world and the world of fine art. So what we see here is Keith Haring out and about, I believe he's in um, in, in Japan in this image. And you can see he's pointing at, um, at like a stand on the side of the road in Japan where, they, where, where he's looking at a sweatshirt that's a knockoff of his designs. Now people were plagiarizing his work all over the world by like the early 1980s. And I mean, it's fairly easy to try and plagiarize. I mean, it's just these simple figures, but you can tell when it's not really his design. People would even send him things like, I found this in Brazil. People, you know, people are, um, were so hungry for the kinds of images that he was producing. He decided with Andy Warhol's blessing and encouragement to create a store that sold his work exclusively. Um, and, and it was, uh, the intention here was to 
sell it for a very low cost to make his artwork as accessible as possible. So it was called The Pop Shop. It was opened in 1986. He said, The Pop Shop makes my world accessible. It's about participation on a big level. So you could go down to Soho in New York City. There was also a pop shop that opened in Tokyo. Uh, he painted the entire inside. You could get prints and buttons and, and bags and t-shirts and all sorts of things and bring home your own you know, favorite Keith Haring design. Note the radiating baby. You could get it for about $3 back then. Um, so, I, uh, and I mentioned before, it was sort of Keith Haring's logo. He said once, that he believed the baby to be the purest form of the human experience. He says, there is nothing negative about a baby ever. And that's why he kind of adopted that as his own. So here he is cutting out the, the, the world of fine art. He's not looking for rich collectors. He's looking for you and me. And he says, you know, if you like what I'm doing, you spend three bucks or 10 bucks or whatever you have on one of these images and you can live with it and, um, and enjoy it. So here's just another view of the pop shop with him standing there confidently. I don't know, that space would give me a little bit of a headache, I think. But, um, but this was, like I said, exactly the kind of thing that, um, that Andy Warhol would have been really Really interested in. This is a t-shirt with Andy Warhol's face on it over here in the background. So, um, so Andy Warhol actually uh, um, dreamed about, fantasized about this world of a mechanized future. Um, he always talked about, I want to be a machine. And so these are Keith Haring's prints that are called Pop Shop. And here it's like as though Keith, Keith Haring has made this machine that seems to be producing his iconic figures. I love how this one's sort of getting pulled out, like he's cranking these things out like a machine himself. Now the Pop Shop stayed open for nearly nearly 20 years. It shut down in 2005. And that mural that he painted is now just above the, um, the admissions desk at the New York Historical Society. And you can still buy licensed Keith Haring merchandise um, online at uh, the uh, Keith Haring Foundation. And it's still relatively, I mean, surprisingly cheap. If you went to a Keith Haring special exhibition at a museum, it would probably be three times that. So it's still very accessible. Now, during his lifetime, Keith Haring also um, worked collaboratively with different product lines in order to uh, essentially promote his images and promote the products. So these are four swatch watches that he designed. If that term doesn't just take you right back to the 1980s, I don't know what will. Uh, complete with you know those, those signature dancers that he did. I think that was his most popular design. And occasionally he would even sign the, the watch band of the swatch watches that he that he made and so this particular complete set with a signed band is currently listed online for ten thousand dollars and just a reminder um, swatch watches were supposed to be you know um, high design but but affordable they were like fifty dollars back in the 80s now ten thousand dollars he also loaned um, his artwork to the absolute vodka um, marketing campaign that longest and most successful marketing campaign in history. Andy Warhol had already done his own absolute vodka bottle campaign. And here, it, and he encouraged Keith Haring to do it as well. Here's Keith Haring's take. One of the things that I want to just point out to you is, um, is that bottle and the symmetry of the bottle, the beauty of that um, sort of clean line of that bottle was really at the heart of the campaign. But because Keith Haring did everything freehand without um, without a plan, without tracing. Uh, you'll notice here that the bottle's like a little bit asymmetrical. And so you'll see these kinds of, um, these kind of, like there, it's like deviating from, from that perfection that you might expect in a finished work of art. Something like this, we can see sort of paint dripping too. This is because he always works so quickly, but beyond the vodka bottle here, he's showing us these dancing figures. It looks like a night at the paradise garage for him. He would also paint cars <laughs> for special marketing campaigns. This is a, a Range Rover, a BMW, and this is a child-sized Ferrari 
over here, painted more cars than this. But notice that this is all over patterning. This brings me back to like the Jackson Pollock that we looked at uh, at the beginning of the program. And he was just working without a plan. This was like tapping into his unconscious. He would always play music while he was working. Um, some art historians talk about him sort of dancing these performances while he painted. So, um, so that connection back to movement is always there. Now, after his death, the, the Herring Foundation continues to license his artwork for anything from espresso cups and saucers to dog bowls, to t-shirts at Abercrombie and Fitch, to Mac Cosmetics. If you need an Andy Warhol in your room, you could just go to Ruggable and buy a, a Andy Warhol, a Keith Herring design rug on, on Ruggable right now. Uh, uh, museum stores have all sorts of products that are inspired by Keith Herring's designs, including a chess set over here, and then things come full circle. The um, Funko Pop figurines even have a Keith Herring figure. So now he is the commodity, not just his artwork. So if all of this is leaving kind of a bad taste in your mouth, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch, really, maybe this next section will redeem him for you. So Keith Herring made murals and public projects all over the world, from Pisa to Paris to Melbourne, Australia. He made over 50 major murals and about 30 of them still exist. Perhaps the Crack is Whack mural is, is his most famous and there's a great story that goes along with it. Keith Haring was driving on this highway that connected Harlem to the Bronx, and he noticed this abandoned handball court with this empty wall there. And he thought, wow, that wall would make like a great billboard. And then when the crack epidemic of New York City um, in the 1980s sort of impacted him personally, there was a studio assistant that he had that became addicted to crack. He decided one day, He's going to rent a van, load in some paint and, and some ladders and just go to this abandoned handball court and make his statement. So um, without a plan, <laughs> without any sketches, this is exactly what he does. I love this next image here because as he's working, you can see people just coming and hanging out and watching him. And this is probably like what fed his soul while he was working on it. At one point he said, um, I think to a few friends that were there, if you have a ladder, you look official, nobody bugs you. So we can see the mural that is underway here. It has a crack pipe and burning money, skulls, and um, a figure with an X on his chest. Usually that means death sentence in, um, in Keith Haring's artwork being fed to this monster here. Now all is well and good, nobody bugged him. Um, but then right after he was done, he sat down and he smoked to join. And that's when the police came up and started asking him about what he was up to and uh, all about this mural. And when it turned out that they discovered he didn't have permission to do this, he was arrested. He faced a year in prison. Um, but then almost immediately, the media began to use this mural as part of the stories around the crack epidemic. Even, I believe, the city of New York was using it in anti-crack messaging. So then the I, apparently it was the mayor of New New York City got into this bind. It was like, he's anti-crack, but he's anti-graffiti. How do you handle this? So he reduced uh, Keith Haring's sentence down to just a $100 uh, fee, which he was easy, easily could pay. Um, but then <laughs> they ran into another problem, and that was the crack is whack mural, which all of a sudden became pretty important, was defaced by someone else and it was turned into a positive crack message. So then after arresting him for painting this, the city had to ask him to come back and repaint Crack is Whack. <laughs> This is the new Crack is Whack mural that Keith Haring uh, then painted. And this is the head of the Parks Department of New York City helping Keith to graffiti this park in particular. And this is, I think, one of the best parts of this. Oh, well, before we get to that, I just want to show you the second Crack is Whack mural, which I, in some ways to me is a more successful mural because we just have this large skeletal figure here, crack pipe, burning money, but you have all of those recognizable Keith Haring figures years throughout. And instead of looking like they're partying at the Paradise Garage, they look like they are writhing in, you know, the, the um, fires of hell, really. It looks like a death sentence there. So um, in some ways, to me, I think uh, a more 
sort of signature Keith Haring design. He also painted the back of that same abandoned handball wall. And all and both of these murals were actually recently restored. But the, the postscript to all of this that I just love is that the park was revitalized by something like this. And it is now known as officially Crack is Whack Playground. <laughs> So imagine, you know, taking your kids, going to meet some neighbors at Crack is Whack. <laughs> it's just too funny. So, um, so like I said, he was painting these murals all over the world. This is a mural that he was uh, painting in Melbourne, Australia. And like I said, along with, you know, go, it, the same is true going back all the way to the subway drawings. He never made a plan for these. He never made a sketch. He just started working. And as he worked, he never stepped back. Even Michelangelo took down his scaffolding to see what his um, what his Sistine Chapel ceiling looked like halfway through, halfway to being done. Keith Haring never stepped back. He never needed to get a sense of proportion or scale. He just worked and he worked so fast. So this is the completed mural in Melbourne, Australia, the recognizable figures in all sorts of poses here. They kind of look like they're falling with that centipede figure, a, um, a few more forms that are riding it, the, um, the monitor, the computer monitor for a head over here with a, a depiction of a brain. So um, here's another uh, large scale project that he did for a museum in Amsterdam. He was asked to uh, cover this vellum, this kind of light reducing vellum that's on the ceiling here. It's a uh, it's a square footage, well, it's roughly 40 by 66 feet. He did it in a day with spray paint. This is the artist at work and he did it in front of a crowd. I love that he's just, you know, walking along this vellum with no shoes on. I mean, just holding a spray paint can for that long is really taxing, but he worked so quickly that he was able to get it done. And in the end, it's such an incredible visual. And and it's so densely striking. In 1986, um, Keith Haring was invited to Berlin by the Checkpoint Charlie Museum to create a mural on the Berlin Wall. Now, um, he had really strong feelings about the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall, as many people did in the 1980s. And, um, and he knew that just going there and, and painting on this wall could have been arrested. He could have been shot. While he was doing this, I mean, there were guards and towers in Easter, East Berlin um, that had massive guns strapped to their chest that, that, I mean, could have taken his life for making this work of art. But it was, it was a wall that sowed fear and divisive and this was the antithesis of everything he believed in as an artist. So he went to Berlin, he painted on this wall that was already pre-painted yellow in advance for him, and then he only used red and black. So the colors here are the traditional German flag. He is trying to make a statement about unity by making this chain of um, unified figures here. But this is, it's a massive expanse. The wall's 14 feet tall. He painted about a 300 foot expanse of the wall. It only took him five hours to do, which is pretty impressive, but it was a media circus while he was doing it. There was actually even a, 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 an American helicopter in the air following him the whole time. Reporters are pestering him. Um, and he said he'd never worked under such conditions before, but he was very firm about, and we can see some of these guard towers here as well. He was really firm about why he was there. He talked about this as, um, as being a humanistic gesture, even though it's a provocative one. And even though he understood this to be a temporary work of art, he sort of knew that it wasn't going to last there long. It was political and subversive. And by painting on the wall, he felt like he was psychologically destroying the wall. So here he is with the finished product. At the end of the day, the New York Times wrote, the entire world should know that it happened, reinforcing its political significance. Now, he was probably gone for about 24 hours before people began to deface his work. Um, so one person who graffitied over it essentially said something so joyful shouldn't be at, on such a, a horrible wall, essentially. So um, within months, it was probably pretty hard to pick out his mural on the wall. And then of course the wall came down three years later. And so the wall doesn't exist anymore. Keith Haring's mural doesn't exist anymore. Keith Haring actually died about a hundred days after the wall coming down. So he doesn't exist anymore, but he wrote about in his journal how just the fact that it was documented 
the cameras were there and that's all that really mattered. The statement was made, even if the rest of it is all temporary. So one of his last major works I wanted to share with you is um, his mural in Pisa on the side of a church. He was invited to go to Pisa to do this. This is 1989, so this is just months before he died. And you can see um, he's still committed to working even though he was sick at this point in his life. And, um, and his designs, I think, were getting a little bit surreal. I don't know if he felt like freed at this point or maybe disenchanted by, um, by what he was experiencing experiencing in his life, but you, you can see he's taking his familiar forms and changing them. He's making them, um, giving them animal tails or fish or, or bird tails, but there are recognizable forms. There's the devil form, there's an angel, there's a mother with a baby, a figure with a television head, but um, either he's getting more playful or sort of sharing this sort of pathos that he has at, at this point in his life. Now, I just wanted to share with you very briefly too, just a few works that he did with children for children because um, serving children was a huge priority in his life. This is probably the biggest work that he created. It's six stories tall and it's a freehand Statue of Liberty that he painted. And then he invited 900 school children from all five boroughs of New York City to come and fill it in. Now, now, this was to celebrate the um, 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, and it's still considered to be uh, a symbol of unity and patriotism. This is Sir Paul McCartney performing in front of it at the Super Bowl in 2002, so you know, just a few months after 9-11, and this was the image that they pull out to make people feel united and, and patriotic. Uh, Keith Haring, because of his passion for working with children, serving children, uh, did a lot of work for children's hospitals. This is one hospital um, exterior stairwell that he painted in France. So he's living out his boyhood dream, right? So we see the Eiffel Tower in the background big primary colors, familiar outlined figures here. In fact, the children's hospital is not there anymore, but the tower was preserved as a singular work of art. He also designed sculptures. And the one over here on the left is um, outside of a children's hospital in Long Island, I believe. So we can see sort of an adult form that is sort of juggling two child uh, forms on his feet. Here is another Keith Haring sculpture of a figure doing this back bend. He talked about how he envisioned all of these things to be like little playgrounds that people could play on. I wish he had lived longer so he could have like a whole second career as a playground designer because these are so fun. Now, the very last public work that I'm going to show you is Keith Haring standing in front of this kind of cartoon mural that he did in um, 1988. And you might notice here that he looks a little deflated, a little dejected. There's something about the body language, the expression on his face that I think says a lot here. You don't see any sort of his like typical quiet confidence. And that's because this mural was painted at the Reagan White House on the occasion of um, Easter. And so he was happy to be there to, you know, create something for kids. The mural was then um, donated to a children's hospital. But at this time, Keith Haring is living in New York City in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. And of course, the major criticism of, of Reagan at this time was that he was turning a blind eye to this, to this epidemic and he was not helping um, this population, the, the gay population, particularly in New York City that was being decimated by this. And there's a, an account that I read of one of the photographers that was there documenting Keith Haring working who said, what are you doing here? Like, how can you support the, this administration? And Keith Haring sort of shrugged and said, same thing that you're doing here. You know, it's like, you're there for the kids, you're getting a paycheck. So let's turn our attention now to AIDS and advocacy. We'll sort of wrap up with that. Now, Keith Haring um, donated his art, his time, his energy to so many good causes throughout his career. Uh, the African-American Emergency Relief Fund, we can see that he contributed to the poster. Crackdown was a benefit concert. He did the poster for that. He worked on um, anti-apartheid um, 
uh, uh, missions as well. But it's really uh, his work around AIDS and AIDS advocacy that that he's probably best known for. So I think we have to, you know, slow down for just a moment and acknowledge the fact that Keith Haring was a gay man, and um, and then later a gay man living with AIDS. And that was, you know, that makes sense that AIDS becomes the most important cause in his life. This is this very striking photo is by Annie Leibovitz. This is from 1986. And it reminds me that Keith Haring said um, that, that the flow of his drawings was connected to his sexuality. He said, sexual energy may be the single strongest impulse I feel more than art. He wrote that in his journal. So it, it changes the way, you know, you look at all these lines and you think about him moving through this so quickly, moving to the music, it's all connected to him. So even going back to those early subway drawings, there's a hint, the slightest hint of uh, 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 gay themes here. But I mean, it's really hard to distinguish male from female in, in these forms. But he's just sort of suggesting, um, you know, homosexual storylines here, but they become um, much more direct, much more frank by the end of the 1980s, because he's come out of the closet that he's told the world that he's living with AIDS. So he is lending his name and celebrity to National Coming Out Day, to posters um, commemorating the Stonewall riots. And ultimately, he begins to create imagery to um, advocate for safe sex. Um, the new realities of being gay in America meant that sex, of course, was um, playing Russian roulette, essentially. And so he needed to bust taboos to have people um, talk frankly about what sex really meant now in the, the post-AIDS world. And so he would do, do this with his art um, and he would do this with um, his time and his celebrity. He, I mean, he showed up at, at marches and that sort of thing, but it was really his, um, his artwork that I think sort of stands the test of time in terms of his contributions to fighting AIDS. And so he came up with this very simple design, uh, maybe deceptively simple, uh, uh, sort of a take on the three wise monkeys, see no, evil, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And these are figures that are sort of dancing, sort of moving, but they all have X's on their chests. That's the reminder that they've, you know, they've got a death sentence. And so if you are, if you already have AIDS and you're turning a blind eye to it, or you potentially have AIDS, silence equals death. So he is um, trying to change behaviors, which I mean, a lot of artists don't sort of take on this kind of work um, in their lives, uh, no matter whether it impacts them or not. So he's he's literally trying to change behaviors to save lives. Another poster that he did um, to, to try and uh, stop the spread of AIDS was this poster here where we see uh, these two figures kind of working in union as a pair of scissors to uh, cut the snake representing AIDS in half, cut it off. Uh, the group ACT UP had sort of already adopted the pink triangle as their symbol, and Keith Haring would integrate that into his artwork. This is a very densely patterned pink triangle with the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil figures. He also loaned those these kinds of um, designs to guides for teens over here, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and then uh, another poster for ACT UP where we see his familiar dancing figures who have thrown their hands up in the air. They're literally acting up in this case. These are people who, are, um, who have AIDS and are um, agitating for major change. He uh, donated his, his artwork to the album cover for Red Hot and Dance. That was um, from the Red Hot organization, a nonprofit that was using uh, essentially uh, uh, pop culture to combat the spread of AIDS as well. So then you have Keith Haring in 1989 um, founding the Keith Haring Foundation, which still exists today. And it's um, it was a way for him to ensure 
that the philanthropic work that was closest to his heart could continue on after, after his death, because in 1988, he was diagnosed with HIV. And then in 1999, um, he died of uh, complications related to, to AIDS. So this, this foundation um, has two purposes. It serves organizations that serve children, and it also um, works to um, uh, uh, promote education, prevention and care related to AIDS. And so we can see even their, their, um, their street project here has the, has the Keith Haring motif on, on the side of the van. And the, the foundation itself has adopted the radiating baby as well. So all of this gets cut short very quickly because Keith Haring passes away at such a young age. And so what we're looking at here is not a Keith Haring design, but work inspired by his work. We are looking at just one of um, many squares on the AIDS quilt that are dedicated to him and his legacy. And so we can see the, the quilt makers here are using the radiating baby and the angel and, um, and his other motifs to pay homage to the incredible work that he did throughout his life. Now, Keith Haring was an artist whose work, who, you know, sought to create work that couldn't be contained by museums or galleries. And then there's just this, this horrible tragedy that he was just one of the thousands of names um, that was uh, recognized and paid tribute to in the AIDS quilt. And then the AIDS quilt itself was so big it couldn't be contained by the, the mall in Washington, DC. So, um, so his legacy is, um, well, is where we're going to turn our attention to next. Now, Keith Haring died at the age of just 31 years old in 1990. There was a thousand people that attended his funeral in New York City. And, um, and he continues to be celebrated as a major artist today. But every now and then you run into a cultural critic who, who criticizes him because his style never really evolved. He never really found uh, something new during that decade that he was productive. But, um, but he didn't really have enough time to do that, I would argue. I mean, dying at such a young age is just such a tragedy and it's heartbreaking to think what he could have done, what he could have contributed had he lived longer. So um, he was able to produce over 10,000 works of art in that decade. He had 50 one-man shows in that decade. I mean, think about that. That's probably like he was doing a one-man show every few months. <laughs> think about the amount of work that would go into that. And he did 50 major murals. So if he were alive today, he'd be 64 years old. But Keith Haring, in, in some ways, it's beautiful. He will be forever young. Now, he, um, his goal in life as an artist was to make his work accessible. He wanted his work to be seen. And here he is sitting just outside of Paris in front of a blimp that has one of his designs on it. And I mean, that is him achieving all of the dreams. He's, in, he's an artist in France. And could your work be more visible <laughs> if it's on the side of a blimp? Uh, this is one of his uh, uh, iconic figures that was turned into a balloon for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 2008. He is very much a part of American culture now, and he had tremendous impact on artists that came up after him. Artists like Jeff Koons, who kind of celebrates celebrity and the commodification of art. Artists like um, the anonymous artist Banksy, who um, is a graffiti artist who makes these socially conscious works. And then other artists like Murakami who license his very popular designs for all kinds of products today. These artists might not have ever gone in this direction had it not been for Keith Haring. I don't even think we'd have the kind of familiar logos that we know so well today without Keith Haring's uh, influence. There's kind of a hard uh, line design here. It's kind of cartoon influenced. And there's a beautiful simplicity to these kinds of logos that I think Keith Haring had a huge impact on. It all comes back um, <laughs> full circle when 
Google uh, paid, paid tribute to Keith Haring on his birthday about a decade or so ago with uh, his own Google doodle here. So I always love to talk about artists and, um, and how well they do it at auction to wrap up on their legacy. And it's really Keith Haring's kind of later works, the works that get a little bit more surreal, these very densely packed images that are just filled with multiple interpretations, but still with those recognizable figures. These are the works that really um, tend to sell at auction. So, um, so this untitled work over here on the right sold at Christie's last year for just shy of 6 million. Um, there's another work that it, the image is kind of hard to track down that sold for just over 6 million. That sounds pretty great, right? But it pales in comparison to his friend, Andy Warhol, whose work is now selling at auction for close to $200 million. So I think Keith Haring would be fine with this. His goal was never to appeal just to rich art collectors. He would be much happier, I think, if a million people bought a little $3 radiating baby pin, because his goal was always to reach all of us. So we'll end there for now with Keith Haring, and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about him or his work. Jane, thank you so much. Um, we have, we don't have any questions yet. There are a couple comments for you that I'll share with you later. Um, but I had a question, um, the crack is whack picture with yeah. the, with the, um, the parks and rec guy. Can we go back to that? Sure. Cause did you know it, him? <laughs> no, no. It looks to me like he's got a Keith Haring shirt on. Oh yeah, I think they they were like Keith Haring, we love you. You're great. Yeah. See? <laughs> Anything Keith I think Haring that's fantastic. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how the merchandise gets integrated into everything, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Um, if you prefer, um, you could unmute and ask Jane directly if you don't want to type in the chat. Well. <laughs> Well, even um, though it's quiet, I hope all of you are feeling a little inspired by him and, and come away from these deceptively simple designs that he made with a richer appreciation for who he was and really what he was trying to accomplish with these designs. Because at first glance, I was like, what am I going to say about Keith Haring for an hour? But there's a lot there. And, and I certainly have a, a real respect for him. Actually, if you're passionate about him now, I'm going to plug a book that his sister wrote about him called Keith Haring, The Boy Who Just Kept Drawing. It's, it's so well done. And it gives a nice little overview of his work. And I think gives a little bit of an insight into how his family felt about him being, you know, world-renowned artist, but also openly gay man with AIDS in the 1980s. So it's a great book. Um, do you happen to still have that picture open that we talked about before we started? Oh, sure. The Vayner picture? Yep. So um, I asked Jane before we, before we started the program, if she thought there were some echoes of Keith Haring in this work that's um, in downtown Maynard. Um, oh, right. The, um, the, is it the nailer is it, wall? Yeah. Yes. So I think that there's, there's certainly, um, maybe a little bit of influence, but I, I wouldn't say that, 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 that artist whose name, I'm sorry, I don't know, no, um, I don't <laughs> is, is directly copying him, but I think, I think he had a huge influence on, uh, on so many artists today. Uh, because of that strong graphic, you know, black outline that he uses, which seems like, oh, okay, that seems so simple. But it's, I mean, there weren't a lot of artists doing that before him. So something like this, I think would, especially a mural artists who, who need to have like this crisp clarity in, in what they're doing. I think that would have a huge impact on a lot of artists. Do, do you still have that image on your screen? Oh, I don't. I had pulled it up, sorry, on my phone okay, that, before that, we were okay. talking. That's okay. I think um, anyone who lives or shops in Maynard would recognize that it's in the in the town parking lot in what is now called Naylor Court. Yeah. Um, so it, if you if you don't know what I mean, um, stop by in the next few days and 
and see what you think. Um, oh, Susan asked if the pop shop is still there and they closed in 2005. I think the one in Japan closed pretty quickly, but you can still buy all the licensed Keith Herring merch that you might want from his foundation online. And you can feel good about it because that goes back into the good work that they do. Also, they're a really good, um, they're a good resource for, you know, images of his work to, as well, and some information, but I think you kind of have to dig around um, beyond the foundation to get good information on, on, on what he did really in his life. There's a lot of good videos about him on YouTube where you can see him making those subway drawings. And I know there's like the Andy Warhol diaries on Netflix right now that mentioned him a little bit, but it's a little bit more about Basquiat. Um, so it's interesting to, to find good resources on him, but you can definitely find the licensed merchandise online. <laughs> Get your own radiating baby pin. I will admit I bought some too. <laughs> well, Jane, thank you so very much for um, another great talk tonight. And we hope we see everybody back on July 13th. Oh, did you want to say a, a word or two about oh, that talk? Yes. I, I have to say the Earth Art Program, I think, has been a favorite for a lot of people. It's another one where it's like, oh, I don't really know much about Earth Art. Is this going to be fun? Um, but I promise you, I think it's like really changed the way a lot of people mm -hmm. have even thought about that movement. I, um, I highlight four different artists who work in very different styles and really approach the, the whole um subject matter just just differently and it includes Andy Goldsworthy who I think is a favorite for so many so I highly recommend it we're very much looking forward to it so we'll see everybody in a month and thank you so much Jane thanks everybody thanks for your good kind night. words I love that means so good much night. good night